Previously on Puppet History. This is a show where a fuzzy little freak named The Professor teaches a guy named Ryan and a special guest about history. Each week, there's a different lesson, and The Professor rewards his guests with jelly beans. Aw, cute. He also poops jelly beans. He then awards a trophy called the Coveted Cup after consulting with what he claims to be a complex victory algorithm. Ryan has lost every episode, even though he's definitely gotten more jelly beans than the guest on countless occasions. Zach got no questions right, for instance. Sorry, Zach. Each episode also features a musical guest. They all seem a little unwell. In season three, a horse died. Check it out. Sometimes the professor offhandedly mentions a genie. Sometimes it seems like he may have time traveled. We know for sure that he eats spiders and has a perfect score on WikiFeed. Look, okay, so it turns out the professor discovered a magic lamp long ago and wished for the ability to time travel, and the genie was like, whatever, but then everywhere the professor went throughout time, his very presence, being a blasphemous affront to the space-time continuum and all, would cause local inanimate objects to turn into the singing abominations featured at the end of each episode. This whole mess was more than the genie could deal with, so he chased the professor through time, but the little blue ball sack, as Ryan lovingly calls him, always managed to evade capture. So, last season, the genie covertly made a deal with the devil and the demon Asmodeus. In exchange for a coveted cup, Ryan would steal all of the professor's precious jelly beans, making him vulnerable enough for the demon Asmodeus to possess him and then wish himself back to the Cretaceous. This happened and Ryan was pretty psyched, but then he asked Satan if the professor would be all right, and Satan was like, I don't know, man, and Ryan was like, oh boy, I don't know about this, which was merited because as soon as the professor landed in the Cretaceous, this happened. Yikes. Okay, so then last Christmas, there was a big memorial for the professor held by all the singing puppets. But at the end of the service, they remembered that in cleaning up the professor's time travel shenanigans, the genie had actually turned them all back into inanimate objects. So their kind of souls are now trapped in purgatory, aka a beautiful state-of-the-art amphitheater called the Wondrium Arena. Their souls hang in the ether. It's grim. They hope that Ryan can find a way to save them along with the professor. Then there was a shot of the professor in a little egg sack. Excuse me? What's going on there? I don't know. Anyway, the pandemic was really weird, and this is basically what I've been up to the whole time. It's a lot of lore, but I mean, fuck, fucking... Come on, man. just sit back and enjoy the new season. You're going to learn a lot. You'll have a good time. All right? Enjoy season five. Welcome one and all to season five of Puppet History. Today, we'll be taking an ever-winding look at yet another chapter in the heavy, heavy book we call history, while our guests ruthlessly compete for the coveted title of History Master. I am your beloved host, The Professor. Thank you. Now, before cracking in, I know it looked like maybe Ryan Bergara murdered me at the end of last season by hurling my sexy little body back to the Cretaceous period. But clearly, I am here now, and unharmed, so it of course did not work, and I won't be answering any questions because there aren't any questions to be answered. Simple as that, okay? Now, Ryan Bergara, are you ready? Okay, special guest Sarah Rubin, are you ready? I guess. Then let's crack in! This is so... Hmm. The last time I saw you, you were getting sucked into a cosmic butthole. Oh yeah, that was a whole thing. And now you're here. Yeah, I guess I am. If that could happen, that's so crazy that I'm willing to also accept that he's just back. You know what I mean? It's a full life. Yeah. What? No, no, what? <laughs> no, what do you, what are, hey man, you just gotta roll with but, it. Yeah. And the whole internet is, was angry at me for a whole year for killing you and you're not dead. Well, maybe and you I shouldn't have not killed relieved me, huh? that, You ever think about that? I didn't yeah. kill you though. I mean, it's water under the bridge, man. Let's get over that bridge and go learn some stuff, huh? How's that? I'm ready to learn. Okay. I'd yes, love let's... to know some facts wait, wait, and wait, some wait. stories. Am I dead right now? No, you're not dead. You're very alive. Do you think I'm dead? No, I'm just, not to say this would be hell, but. Sarah, give him a little pinch. Okay, that did hurt. Yeah. Okay, let's get into it. Now, what do you think about a juicy, thick with three C's steak? Mmm, my little mouth is just sopping wet thinking about a big old T-bone. You like me? <laughs> it's coming in with a lot of energy. I mean, I like meat, but it's also sort of, you know, it's bad for the environment. Yeah, but it's good for my tummy. <laughs> also bad for my body. Yeah. A steak is as big as... How long does it take you to eat one steak? About a month. All right. <laughs> you like meat, Ryan? Yeah, I do. What's your favorite cut? A fucking, um... Just say a meat. <laughs> tomahawk. A tomahawk. Okay. Showing off. Living up to the beef boy name. So we're just talking now. Yeah, we're just talking now. Get with it. Professor, what's up with that box? Don't talk about the box. I mean, it looks cool. Don't look at my okay. box! Wait, what's going on with it? Don't touch the box! I'm not gonna touch the box. I just... <laughs> no, just, just, just... Don't 
Don't touch me. Okay. Okay. Kind of happy to see you. I mean, boundaries. You guys have been through some stuff. Today, we're visiting a time when steak wasn't as easy to come by in America as it is today, and learning about the weird men who had an unconventional idea for fixing that. Fire up your grills, we're talking about hippo meat. And also just sort of about two a-holes. But the, no, the a-holes are not on the hippos. Not, they're not us, right? We're not the two a-holes. Oh. No, you guys are great. Well, right out of the gate, I am so tempted to ask you who fought in the Second Boer War, but that's such a nasty way to start the season, so I'll just tell you. The Boer War, aka the Second Boer War, was fought from 1899 until 1902 between Great Britain and the two Boer Republics. The Boers were Dutch, German, or Huguenot farmers living in Southern Africa. So, you know, they get up to some stuff down there. Interesting. Yeah. So it was colonizers fighting colonizers? Yeah, fuck them all. Oh, okay, yeah, they don't give a shit. Yeah. Now, even though Britain's military outnumbered the Boers' army by more than five to one during the conflict, the Boers put up a stiff defense as the war was being fought on their doorstep, a long way from home for the British soldiers. In modern warfare, with satellites and drones, it's relatively easy to get information about your enemies. During the Boer War, however, a military had to rely on scouts to learn about the movements and strength of the other side. And as it happened, both sides of this conflict had legendary scouts. Would you guys like to be scouts in the military? If I, I feel like the military is a pretty rough gig on account of uh, having to take human life. What do you think a scout does? I don't know. Just checks places out. Sniffs them. I think. <laughs> Sniffs them. Yeah. I would never want to be a scout, by the way, to answer your question. If I was in the military, I'd be a deserter. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a coward. Mm. I don't want to be in the military. However, sure. I'd love to wear disguises. Like being little a spy outfits. seems cool. Yeah, little outfits. Are yeah, fun. little outfits. I'm in it for the outfits always. Epaulets. Ooh, God, oh, I love my. epaulets. Well, epaulets would give you away, wouldn't like they? Like a little prince. Oh, I just want to dress up like a little prince. I just don't want to kill people. Okay, well, we probably have to move on. On the British side was a real son of a gun named Frederick Russell Burnham. This human chunk of beef jerky was born May 11th, 1861 in Tivoli, Minnesota. While he was still basically a boy, Burnham left his family and made his way to Texas, where frontiersmen took him under their wing, showing him the skills that they'd come to learn while hacking it in the wild. In short order, Burnham had developed a scouting expertise that was practically unrivaled. He learned to make traps, read nature's signs, track horses, shoot, and wayfind. Okay, now I do want to be a scout. It yeah. sounds fucking sick. You had me at traps. With these skills and some natural moxie to boot, Burnham found work guarding mining camps and escorting prospectors through the wild. Eventually, he tried settling down on an orange grove in Pasadena. Now, mind you, this was well before the town had a cheesecake factory or a Buca de Beppo to its name. So you can imagine the guy didn't find it to his liking. It's kind of cool to hear about Pasadena in like the 1860s, because yeah. I only know it as a place, like you said, that has a cheesecake factory. Also a good apple store. Great apple store. For all the people who aren't from Southern California, just picture a big mall of a town with some nice trees and the house from Halloween. That's true, they did shoot Halloween there. Ah, uh, anyway, he didn't like Pasadena. No, he craved the adventure of the outdoors. And so, he set his sights abroad, offering his services to the British, essentially joining the Boer War because he was <laughs> bored. <laughs> <laughs> While it's worth noting that Burnham wasn't like some bachelor with a lust for adventure, he also dragged his wife and son to live in a war zone with him. Thanks, Dad. No. I guess that's somewhat wholesome, though, but rather than leaving them at home. Is it? Yeah, where they were safe and not gonna die. <gasps> you smell that? What's that I'm tracking in the wind? Oh, it's our season's first question! The, the learning, learning has, has begun. begun! Ready your quills, my beauties. Which of the following did Burnham not do while scouting in Africa? A, hide for days in a dang aardvark hole. B, constantly clean and re-swallow six bullets so we always had backup ammo. Or C, float along a river under a cow carcass with two holes cut out for eyes. Okay, one of those he didn't do. Correct. Okay, these are the three craziest things that a person could possibly do. You got this. You both got this. I believe in both of you. How'd you do on the, did you take the SAT? I actually did, uh, Pretty bad, from my <laughs> recollection. No, no, wait, no, I did okay. I don't know anything about it. I couldn't reach the desk. 
<laughs> Couldn't fill out the scantron. They didn't give you a little mini one? <laughs> no. <laughs> You're so mirthful this season. You just Well, I'm to... alive! <laughs> it feels good! <laughs> okay, I've got my answer. Okay, uh, Ryan, what do you got? I... B, bullets ain't food. Okay, and Sarah? B, bullet dinner. Oh, we got my B-boys out there! B-boys! Uh, I can't remember what this bit is. Do we play basketball noises? I don't think we ever did B-boys. It was oh, C-dog. Oh, B-boys, let's do some basketball noises. Okay. Squeak, squeak! Uh, rap, <laughs> rap! <laughs> uh, point for the team! Okay. Um... I'm in hell. Points to both of you! Oh, there it is. Yay! First question of the season. You both got some beautiful little jelly beans. Isn't that wonderful? I should say, I don't know for sure that he didn't have spare poop bullets, but I do know he did those other things. Now, switching our focus to the other side of the conflict, the Boers had themselves a scout known as the Black Panther, described by one writer as a, quote, walking, living, breathing, searing, killing, destroying torch of hate. The Black Panther was at least as crafty and determined as Burnham, and hated the British more than Ryan Bergara hates it when his pre-sale code for Blue Man Group tickets doesn't work. I do hate that. I really do hate that. Let me guess a code. Blue. Is that one of the codes? Yeah. <laughs> The Black Panther was captured twice, escaping both times. The second time, he had been sent to prison all the way in Lisbon, where he seduced the daughter of the jailer, got out, sailed to England to enlist in their army while posing as a Boer defector, got a free ride down to Africa, and immediately went back to helping the Boers. I thought the other guy was badass, but this guy... Pretty yeah. impressive. This guy's unbelievable. How did he seduce the jailer's daughter? He was probably like, uh, hello. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's your line right there, right? <laughs> what if he just like started doing dips in like the cell? Dips? What are dips? You know, like a tricep like dip? dip? Oh like, boy, what if he here was we just, go. What if he was just like, look at this. <laughs> Put the tongue out? Check that <laughs> out. Do the tongue out again? Okay. I'll give you my daddy's keys. <gasps> Daddy, give me the keys. <laughs> Here. Now, during the war, Burnham was supposed to track down and kill the Black Panther, while the Black Panther's job was to kill Burnham. Though the two scouts never crossed paths during the war, both men served their sides admirably, and a mutual respect developed between the two. Burnham would call the Black Panther, quote, one of the craftiest men I ever met. By 1905, his service in Africa concluded, Burnham set off back to California. The America he was returning to, however, had a problem. Woo! What was America's problem in this specific instance? A, not enough meat, also the Spanish-American War. B, not enough meat, also a nearly 700% increase in railroad sabotage. Or C, not enough meat, also questioning its very identity and everything it represented. Huh, interesting. I see a lot of writing over there. Ryan, how you been? We doing this right now? I guess we don't have to. Are we locked in? Yeah. Ryan, what do you got? C, Civil War sucked. Cause like you said, America wasn't sure who it was. I mean, mm. that, the definition of not knowing who you are is fighting, in, in fighting, so. I'm sure, I'm sure. Sarah? I put A, Spanish-American War, meet I think. Sorry, I'm creative. I don't <laughs> know. Fine. I don't know these things. I know generals, general things. That's okay. Um, point to the beef boy! Sure, that will somehow not count. <laughs> don't worry, we'll see what happens. It's all up to the algorithm. You know that algorithm machine is running better than ever this season. season. Yes, never mind that Upton Sinclair had just published The Jungle, showing America how nasty the meat supply was with whole ass men toppling into meat grinders and everyone just kind of shrugging about it. The public still demanded their meats, but there was simply not enough flesh. Supple, life-defining flesh. The meat question, as it came to be known, prompted some deep introspection about who the nation even was. America was a nation of innovators and problem solvers. What would happen to our reputation if we couldn't solve a problem as basic as we're burger? We love our burgers, right? We do love burgers. They were like, burgers. the only thing we have to solve right now burgers. is burger. Nothing Everything else. Everything else is perfect. To be fair, if I lived in a world without burgers, I'd drive into the ocean.
You drive into the ocean. That's right, just to make sure bye -bye. that it's over. What would be your me alternative? Like if you couldn't get cow, say all the cows are gone. Cows gone. No cows turkey, gone. No Global turkey. warming solved. What burger are you going for? Yeah, what strange animal would you like to put on a burger? Well, probably turkey burger is fine. No, okay, I said a no strange turkey. Animal. I said strange. Turkeys are perfectly wonderful and normal. Strange is kissable. Strange is totally subjective. I think turkeys are weird as hell. What's going on with the little red ball sack on their chin? Um, I'd like to eat a beaver. Oh, oh yeah. no. I know that's like a watcher thing, but I also do, I've been thinking about that a lot. Like, what does the tail taste like? Yeah. Uh, in my downtime, I've really been thinking about like, just what does a beaver taste like? So uh, I'm gonna say that. In your downtime, you've been thinking a lot about what a beaver tastes like? I'm just like curious about like the tail specifically. Like imagine the tail on like a sub roll. Oh. Like maybe it's fried. What if it's a sandwich where the two pieces of bread are the beaver tails and inside is just a big old sloppy heap of beaver meat? That sounds like a lot. Mm. I love beavers. I think they're adorable little creatures. I love when they plop their little tail on like a puddle yeah, and it slap, makes a funny slap, little slap. noise. Mm, yeah, and then you're like, what would that taste like? That being said, I bet you that tail is fatty as hell. Uh, I've read that I it would tastes, never do it. I've read that it tastes very sweet and buttery. Oh God, I won't. That makes so sense because they look fatty. I would never eat a beaver though out of principle. Probably, I guess like a penguin maybe would be interesting. A penguin is so That's much cuter. Up. Nah, wrong? dude, beavers are cute as hell. But think about how many movies penguins have been in. We know them. We know their stories. Beavers. You, uh. You're talking about Happy Feet? I'm talking about Happy Feet. I'm talking about Surf's Up. I'm talking about Mar Penguins of Madagascar. March of the Penguins. I'm gonna say March of the Beavers. I'd watch that. Imagine just a procession of beavers in a line, their little tails all flopping. Of them, all of them slapping. In synchronization yeah. as they're walking. And me walking up behind them with an eye <laughs> Jesus <laughs> Christ. <laughs> If only there was some better way to use our less hospitable lands, say, the deserts of the Southwest, or, I don't know, the bayous of the South. And while we're brainstorming, I know cows are big, but what if we had some even bigger, fleshier source of protein so we could get more bang for our bull, so to speak? Well, having spent much of his life scavenging for nutrition in the wilderness, Burnham knew how to think outside the box about food, believing, quote, the man of one diet is hopelessly handicapped, for nature has made it possible for a well-organized human being to wrest sustenance out of a thousand foods. One of those thousand foods happened to weigh thousands of pounds and loved swampy terrain. You know I'm talking about that sweet, wet river horse, the hippopotamus. God, they look juicy. Oh, they gotta have a lot of meat on them, man. They look like a big ass jelly bean like, with eyes. Oh yeah, meaty, meaty, meaty. Dangerous though, don't they kill? They, like, oh, they're they yeah. very dangerous animals. They're yeah. horrifying. And I, they could run fast as shit and they could swim fast and they have those big ass teeth. Chompers. They're not as vindictive, I would say, as like perhaps like an elephant. An elephant is hardcore and metal. You know what I mean? Are they? Did you not hear that story about that elephant recently? What'd he do? This elephant trampled this woman to death. What? And yeah. then it came back to the funeral and trampled her again. That's a true story. Did she say some like messed up shit to the elephant? Did she or like spoil the six? That's sense? what you're getting from that. The point of the story is the elephant remembered her and was like, not only do I not like you in life, I'm gonna make sure your loved ones can't even celebrate you. It's amazing. The elephants are usually kind of sweet, so I do feel like she must have done she something. She did something. You know? Not to yeah. victim blame, but not to victim blame, but I'm blaming that victim. Apparently, she was trying to get water from a watering hole, so maybe it was like that's my watering hole, yeah. not yours. Yeah. You know Time what, we're just, we're just visitors in That's their right. domain. On Mother Gaia. Oh, and sometimes won't. Mother Gaia can be a nasty woman. <laughs> <laughs> a vindictive bitch. That's right. Well, Burnham tried to get the government to see that hippos could be a solution to its grumbly little tum tum. But he didn't get very far. To become a reality, such an unorthodox idea needed a champion inside Congress to shepherd it and build support. Enter Robert Broussard. Hello there. Congressman Robert Broussard was a popular Democrat from Louisiana with essentially no political competition in his district. That meant he could bring forth a novel idea without worrying about facing ridicule from challengers in the next election. Even better, Broussard saw importing hippos as a way not just to address the food question, but another problem plaguing his constituents. Ooh. What problem was that? A. Too many bunnies. B. Too many flowers. Or C. Too many chocolates. What? Uh oh. Something falling? I don't see anything. Okay. Is this place haunted? 
the ghosts were in the studio all along. I don't know. The boo goo machine back at uh, Watcher HQ is a long way away from here. It was at that moment that our audio recorder picked up uh, this dinky HQ little noise. Way away from here. The Bugu containment unit. You know a lot about ghosts, Professor. Yeah. yeah, I do. Are you a ghost? What kind of question is that? Come on. You oh got, yeah, because you got eaten by a dinosaur. I think that's a pretty fair question. <laughs> I mean, I went through some stuff. You mean mm. death? Okay, right. What do you got? I got A for uh, abundance of bunnies. <laughs> Sarah? I put too many bunnies. <gasps> is that a little bunny? I drew a bunny also. Just. Maybe that'll get me I some love that. Jelly. Yeah. A little bonus point for that bunny. There you go. Yeah, tasty. Mm. Nom, 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 nom. Well, at last, a dose of culture descends upon us as we will now learn the answer through the magic of theater. I'll be back in just a second. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> I love when he does a little show. Where's these fucking people? <clears throat> Congressman Broussard, my name is Clint, and I have a problem. Oh dear, Clint, it tears my heart in twain to hear that. Is it the meat question? Well, meat is hard to come by these days, but, well, promise you won't laugh. My other problem is flowers. The water hyacinths are clogging the waterways. Our shipping routes are ruined, and they're killing the fish by sucking up all the oxygen in the water. Some days I wish some sort of hungry, Hungry animal could come and just gobble up all them flowers. Hmm, a hungry, hungry animal, you say? <laughs> well, I, I may just have an absolutely batshit crazy idea. So we don't get points then. <laughs> okay, points to neither of you. It was flowers. Except for the arbitrary one you gave her. Mm. Not arbitrary. It was hard. earned. Yes, first brought to Louisiana in 1884 as gifts from the Japanese delegation at the International Cotton Exposition, the asexually reproducing water hyacinth quickly spread, causing huge problems for anyone whose livelihood depended on the waterways. Looking to kill two birds with one hippo-sized stone, Broussard introduced HR 23261, which would allocate a quarter of a million dollars to import hippos and other animals to the U.S. When it came time to debate, Broussard brought in three men to testify in favor of the bill. First, a nerd from the Department of Agriculture, W.N. Irwin, talked about the benefits of such a bill, describing Hippo as, quote, good, wholesome flesh for our people. That's a nerdy-ass name. Did W.N. stand for what a nerd? <laughs> <laughs> Bonus jelly for Sarah, because that was a funny joke. Next was Burnham, who brought up how the meats of American diets, cows, pigs, poultry, and sheep, were all largely imported from Europe hundreds of years ago. Why not import more? After Burnham, a third expert was called. Who, who was the third expert? A. Immigrant writer and opportunistic showman Fritz Duquesne. B. Former U.S. president and conservationist Theodore Roosevelt. Or C, cattle rancher and wanted felon, Anton Chigurh. <laughs> okay, that can't be right. How are you feeling about this one? You guys feeling confident? No. Okay. I mean, I feel confident that's not Anton Chigurh. Unless that's based off a real person. It's Holy not, shit. It's not. No, no, don't worry, don't worry. That would suck. I hate Oh my god, that would be He's still out there. If the last <laughs> oh thing I saw god. in life was uh, was that haircut, holy shit. Ryan, what'd you put? Put A for Fritz. Fritz. Just because I want that name to be real. I want him to be a real person. Sarah, what do you got? I put Fritz Duquesne, and I hope this doesn't bite me in the butt, but I, I feel like I've heard of him. Oh! So hopefully it's a real person. <laughs> well, jelly beans for both of you! Hooray! Well, if you don't remember Fritz, maybe you know him better by his alias, the Black Panther! Oh, that's good. This, why, this has to be a cinematic event! That's right. Burnham and his lifelong nemesis, the Black Panther, AKA Fritz Duquesne, were testifying alongside one another. Can you imagine having to sit next to a person who has explicitly tried to kill you while you educate people about hippos? <laughs> but. Just kidding. <laughs> I didn't um, try to kill you. Anyway. 
How did these two rivals find themselves on the same side of a congressional hearing? Well, after his side lost the Boer War, Duquesne essentially had nothing apart from his scouting skills and an all-consuming hatred of Great Britain. Duquesne made his way to America, where he began writing articles about Africa for the New York Sun, eventually turning his stories into a touring lecture, capitalizing on a surge of interest in Eastern Africa thanks to now former President Roosevelt's well-publicized travels there. By luck, when Broussard was gathering his panel of experts, Duquesne was lecturing in D.C. Duquesne was popular at the hearing, pointing out how well his hippo-fed side had fought in the Boer Wars, then explaining how hippos are easy to train and not dangerous. The hearing concluded with few if any reasons why the idea wasn't a home run. The idea of postmating some hippos from Africa swept through the media. Some balked, with one op-ed in the Washington Herald arguing, quote, we cannot eat things that give us the shudders, no matter what their undisputed food value may be. Essentially the same argument toddlers raise about broccoli. Others embraced the idea, excited to try a hippo pot pie for themselves. That sounds fucking good. Yeah, I'm trying to think of what would... I'd like to have some, like, hippo mac and cheese. Oh, God! <laughs> I just kind of want it cubed. Just like a big old cube of, like, hippo meat. Oh, I'm just imagining being at a grocery store and just one of those old ladies with those plastic-ass gloves being like, You want to try some hippo? You want a pound of hippo meat for your charcuterie platter? I'm oh. curious what its, like, texture is because the first thing that comes to mind is, like, a whale. Yeah. And yeah. a whale is, like, super blubbery. But I guess they are kind of like cows. I would guess they're pretty steak-like. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I was picturing blubber too kind of almost like yeah like a like a bone marrowy kind of like feel because they had they're so chunky well fast forwarding 110 years we don't eat that much hippo in america oh, so why didn't hippo meat take off a duquesne murdered burnham b rumors of hippo pox led louisiana to ban the animal or c Basic fundamental communication issues. All right. Okay. Oh, didn't like that. Yeah, I don't know. That was, <laughs> I like taking that. a nap. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> gonna go with A, murder, I guess. Okay, okay, and Sarah? I'm gonna go see the thing that hurts any great uh, venture, communication. Sure. Yeah. A jelly bean for Sarah! Communication uh, is important, like is. something that a genie tells you will not happen and yet does. Always gotta read the fine print on those things, you yeah, know? Yeah, really gotta check that out. No one ever reads it. You ever read the terms and conditions on like an update? I read them all. I doubt it, I doubt that very much. Do you read the terms and conditions? Yeah. Or you just scroll down and press agree, read? I mean, you know. Be honest. I don't got a lot of time, you know. So. <laughs> I knew it. Yes, as hard as it is to get three people together to work on something these days, imagine doing so without text messages and email. Basically, instead of anything straight up defeating the idea, it appears to have just slowly faded from everyone's minds and just, uh, never came to pass. Eventually, the meat market stabilized not because of imported animals, but due to industrial agriculture. More land was made usable, and more animals were put on said land. Hippo meat became a solution looking for a problem. Isn't that sad? I'm sad because I wanted to know what the hippo meat tasted like. Yeah. I mean, we can get some here. We could postmate some if you want some. All right, great. So you mean to tell me that this whole issue that they congregated about just solved itself? It seemed like there was a lot of people being like, hey, are we doing this? And someone else would be like, yeah, don't worry, we're working on it. Uh, and nobody ever really pulled the trigger on it. So moral of the story is procrastination is good then. I guess. God knows, if they had succeeded, you know, America might be running rampant with feral hippos. That doesn't sound bad. It uh, yeah. does if they're, you know, violent. Just every now and then a TikTok of someone getting wrecked in a Walmart. Actually, that sounds line. great. That sounds great, right? You've changed my mind. Fighting a hippo with a shopping cart, imagining that, that'd be yeah. kind of cool. Or we would have domesticated them so we would have had little hippo pets. Keep them small. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Duquesne found himself in a similar situation. Back when Africa and hippo meat were in the zeitgeist, he had a livelihood and a purpose. But as hip popularity receded. <laughs> I was wondering when a hippo pun was going to come into play. Yeah. Well, you got there. And then you disappointed. As hip popularity receded, however, the Black Panther needed a new way to make a living. Duquesne was rudderless and restless, in search of some circumstance that called for his cobbled-together set of skills. 
1914, that circumstance presented itself. World War I! Remember, thanks to the Boer Wars, Duquesne hated England with all of his being, so he decided he had to help Germany any way he could. Duquesne made his way to Brazil, where he offered his services as a spy to the German consulate. He used his skills sabotaging English shipments with explosives, eventually blowing up the SS Tennyson as it sailed to New York. Investigators discovered Duquesne was responsible, but it was too late. On April 27, 1916, the New York Times reported that Duquesne had been murdered while riding through Bolivia. The Black Panther had finally been slain. Oh, what happened to Duquesne's body? A. It was transported to America, where it toured around the country. B. It was shipped to South Africa, where it received a hero's funeral. Or C. It was sent to Burnham in Mexico, so it could be identified and burned. Sad to see him go, you know. He was fighting for Germany in World War I, so not a great look, but... You guys locked in? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you got? I'm going with D, devoured by hippos. That <laughs> is not. That's what happened, right? <laughs> right no, that right. happened. Uh, Sarah, what do you got? I'm going with C, Burnham Burnham. Well, for this answer, we have someone who was actually there. Dashing war hero, Captain Claude Stoughton. Captain Claude, take it away. If this story doesn't end with someone being eaten by a hippo, I'm gonna be pissed off, because that has to happen at least once. Thank you, Professor. The answer is A, so points to nobody. But a word of warning, not everything on this stage is as it seems. <laughs> like that box? Shut up. For instance, I am actually Berthold Shavo. <gasps> A.K.A. Von Gotthard, A.K.A. Frederick Barron, A.K.A. F. Krabs, A.K.A. Colonel Bezin, A.K.A. Fitz Du Kane! That's right, the Black Panther, baby! I'm still alive! Touring the nation disguised as Captain Claude. Oh, I truly am the most irascible. Oh, hello? Hi, who are you? I'm the police. <laughs> How are you? Great, you're coming with us, you're under arrest. Oh no, why do I still go by my real name? Now I'm going to jail for blowing up those ships in World War I. Uh, you're going to jail for insurance fraud. What's this about blowing up ships? Oh, shoot. Holy shit. I mean, if your name is Fritz Duquesne, it's probably hard to not go by it. Yeah, it's a pretty sweet name to have to like withhold that information would be almost unavoidable, actually. <laughs> it's me again. Cool. Hey. Hi. Okay, <laughs> a bit of a nasty trick with that question, but you should expect nothing less when dealing with the Black Panther. That's crazy, yeah, it was him. He, he was alive. How long did he survive under this disguise? Uh, for a bit. Damn, he is good. Yeah, he's good. He's real he's good. good. Yes, Duquesne faked his death, then changed his mind, which I guess is always an option in these situations. Duquesne headed back to America, where he tried another lap on the Africa lecture circuit. But audiences were over wilderness exploits. They wanted tales of heroism from their fighting boys overseas. And to meet that demand, Duquesne pretended to be fictional hero Claude Stoughton, and actually made some decent scratch touring, claiming he'd been bayoneted and gassed multiple times. In fact, all of those names he mentioned earlier, plus more, were aliases the Black Panther used, eluding capture from authorities while trying to make a living. It feels like a fun thing to do. Like, if I could fake my own death and get away with it, yeah. and be, um, you know, uh, Burgess Moncleef I for the rest that. of my life. Love that. Uh, that sounds great. The rules are if you fake your own death, you have to choose a cartoon Rocky and Bullwinkle villain name. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Burgess Moncleef would be my name, and I would live a life selling insurance in Iowa. I'd be Bernadette Roselier. Oh, what would oh you do? Oh my God. Um, in a circus, I'd be a, a ringmaster. <laughs> what do they call it? Ringleader, ringmaster? Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, come one, come all to the greatest show on earth. I'm Bernadette Roselier. <laughs> the point being, you can't do that today. Like, I do that, someone would be like, aren't you that idiot who hunts ghosts? And you'd say, no, yeah. I'm Burgess. Yeah, I'd have a mustache too. Oh, of course you would. Oh, then no one would recognize no you. And you should does. shave off your eyebrows. Mm. And get a face tattoo. Just to be sure. I don't know about that part, okay. but we could workshop later. Get a nipple ring or two. 
Mm. That, that would, would be... I don't know how that would uh, help. So I would have... We're your... chopping some stuff here. I would have <laughs> cut out nipples on my shirts at yeah. all times. Yeah. Mm. I mean, you don't do that now as Ryan Bergara, so... Well, that's a pretty good idea, actually, because mm. then I could be like, ha, my eyes are up here. You know what I mean? <laughs> Get married first, then unleash that part of yourself. Oh, wait, married. wait, Burgess, pitch. So you cut out the holes on your shirt, yeah. then you say, my eyes are up here, but then you've got a tattoo on your forehead that says, my nipples are down there. That's good. <laughs> so they could be pretty much on like a loop, going back and forth, yeah. back and forth, and that's how I hypnotize people. Well, I'm excited to see you become that guy. Now, as we saw, Duquesne was eventually arrested for fraud. Hilariously, he tried to get an insurance payment for some film footage that was destroyed on the SS Tennyson, the boat he blew up. Once arrested, Duquesne's mental and physical health deteriorated. He began behaving erratically, collapsing during the trial, his legs suddenly paralyzed. The government wasn't gonna let this slippery snake get away, though. They tested Duquesne, sticking pins in his legs and even under his toenails. When Duquesne didn't flinch, he was transferred to a mental hospital where the immobile patient was doted on by nurses. And in the early hours of May 27th, 1919, Frederick Duquesne, the Black Panther, escaped. Escaped! I knew it! I knew it! Yes, he escaped! Point for the beef boy! Having faked being paralyzed for seven months. How did he escape? Did he use like a bunch of bed sheets tied together or something oh, like that? Yeah, sure. He like made a wig out of a mop. I like that too. Well, continuing a streak of always picking the losing side, Duquesne went on to spy for Germany in World War II. His hatred of England governing literally every decision he ever made to the extent that he ended up being a goddamn Nazi. He was caught in an elaborate FBI sting and sentenced to prison for 18 years. Did he escape this prison too? This guy's like Rocket Raccoon. Well, <laughs> no one could hold them. On May 24th, 1956, Fritz Duquesne died in New York City. We think. For an epitaph, perhaps his FBI file summarizes Duquesne best. Quote, excellent talker with captivating personality. Inveterate liar, sexual pervert. Sweet. Nice. I like your tombstone, Professor. <laughs> yeah, we'll get there, That's yeah. what yours read. I didn't write it. I was scared the professor was gonna pull off his <laughs> glasses. And, and he was gonna be Fritz Duquesne. <laughs> As for Burnham, he continued to live a life of adventure. While Duquesne was blowing up boats in Brazil, Burnham was mineral scouting in the American West. Cool. Frederick Burnham died on September 1st, 1947. The real life inspiration for the Boy Scouts. The good parts, that is. Yep. It's a worthy pursuit to collect minerals and rocks. I used to do that as a child. I used to have a chest full of them. Yeah, what happened to it? I still have it. Sometimes I look at them every now and then when I go back to my parents' house. How long do you look at them for? <laughs> what time of night do you yeah. look at them? I don't think I'll tell you about that. Okay. <laughs> Keep your secrets. <sighs> well, looking back on the brief flash in U.S. history, when hippo meat was seriously proposed before Congress, it's easy to feel a tinge of nostalgia for a time when the government could entertain novel ideas in good faith. And while you may yearn for a lost time of fun news with hippos, frontiersmen, and flowers, one thing's just as true now as it was then. Getting people to accept something new is really, really difficult. What a weird story, huh? Liked Fritz. Could have used more hippos, honestly. Yeah. I, I thought there was a kind of shocking lack of hippos in the story. There's a shocking lack of hippos in America. Well, that concludes our history lesson. I'm going to go tally the scores to see who receives the title of history master. While I do that, please enjoy the special performance from a big old hippo who just wants to get eaten. Ugh. Bye. <laughs> a vor hippo? Oh, God. <laughs> to encourage for. <laughs> I mean, isn't that what it is? You want to get eaten? Yeah, but... I'm not, he's encouraging it. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, I'm merely a bystander. <laughs> now who's that sexy piece of ass in the lake? It's me. I'm a big beefy hippo and I want you to know what you Missing while you're eating all that dusty ass steak Well I'm juicy and all yours This water pump is begging you on all fours Ring that bell, grab your bones The hippo bottom BBQ's begun oh. Oh. And down around a brand new flame
flavors coming to your town From the shores of Maine to California They're gonna see my kicks down at the old buffet I'm 3,000 pounds of meat, come on, give me a try I'm bleeding, come on, eat some of my hippo pot pie Oh, don't knock it till you've had a taste Get your Yankee ass on board with the beef of the lake You're telling me you've never wanted a change All your days spent to a chicken, turkey, and pork It's bunch o'clock and it's high time you sample some strange What more could you want than a wet, wet burger from the swamp? Say goodbye, I won't tell your wife I'm so delicious that I'll ruin your life Ooh. Grab a boat, take a seat my big old hippo ass is here for you to eat Marinated in the bayou stew My sopping chops are gonna make you drool I'm 3,000 pounds of meat, but you give me a try I'm playing, come on, eat some more my hippo pot pie oh, Don't knock it till you have a case Get your Yankee ass on board with the beef of the lake Yes, oh, some mustard on my lower back Oh, yeah, that feels nice Sriracha, ketchup, up to my hippo crack I don't mind the spice That's how you garnish a hippo Oh, and don't forget oh, A couple of pickles on my middle hippo nipples oh, Throw some charcoal on the pit Let it go on, roast me on the spit I really think I'm pretty good in a stew I'm just a simple bayou hippo wanting inside of you I'm 3,000 pounds of meat and I'm ready to die Just to treat you to the ecstasy of hippo pot pie Don't rock till you've had a Get your Yankee ass on board with the beef of the lake Whoa! Oh, oh, what a juicy performance! Now. Let's see how we did. You guys are never going to believe this, but according to the algorithm, this week's history master is Ryan Bergara. Whoa, Sarah, thanks for trying. Um, hey, you've already got a couple trophies. Um, okay. We've actually had a supply chain issue with the trophies this season, so we don't have a coveted cup for you, but come get your prize. Here it is. Ooh, what's that? The official moisturizer of History Masters. Here you go, buddy. Come get it. Come on. Yes, it's real. Well, now I'm jealous because I do want that. Here you go. Congrats. Um, Wait, what? You okay? It's okay. Puppet cream. It's for champs. Apply daily. It's for champs. Make sure you use that a lot. You got to moisturize that skin of yours. Put some on. Yes. Put it on the skin. Yes. Yeah, yellow layer in there. There, oh, there you go. <laughs> powerful. Rub that in. Rub. <laughs> Rub. All right. Rub. It's a weird episode. Um. Rub. All right. Well, that about does it for this week, Sarah. Thank you so much for coming. All the rest of you, thanks for watching. We'll see you next week on Puppet History, where the details are always a little fuzzy. Bye bye. Woo! Fucking Connie again. All right. Hello? Hello? Hi, 
Puppets give me the creeps. All right. Oh, the crop died. Good night, Watcher.